Okay, if you will, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. I am so excited because the end is near. The end is in sight for these three chapters that have been so hard and they have been hard. And I, I like to tell people that when you get to the end of chapter 11, it, it, we have to take a lot of time here, Romans 9, 10, and 11. But when you get to the end of that, it begins to pick up again uh, and really start putting more pieces of the puzzle together. But we have to understand that these three chapters were placed here for a reason, for a purpose. And as we started it months and months ago uh, in Romans chapter nine, we realized that um, I'm just going to kind of give a little brief summary as I get up to where we are tonight. We realize that Paul has, he tells us in scripture here in Romans chapter nine, that he has a great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart for his brethren. So he's not forgetting who he is in the root system, so to speak, that he is an Israelite. He is um, of, of that. He said, I could wish, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. That's Romans 9 verse 3, uh, for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So we started out Romans 9 with Paul just diving right in and starting to talk about his brethren, his kinsmen in the flesh, so to speak. And he's taken three chapters in Romans that he's talked about Israel in this dispensation of grace time period. And we've learned a lot. Sometimes we might not realize what we've learned until we reread it uh, in its entirety. And within it starts making that, that picture come together even more clearly. But we started out in Romans chapter nine. Now we, we talked about the fact that parenthetical things mean something in scripture. When you see something in parentheses, it's it's an, a further expounding, if you will, on that particular subject. Um, so 9 through 11 is that parenthetical. So Paul further used these three chapters to expound to us more about Israel and, and their program. We, we learned, number one, that we are not spiritual Israel. We are not spiritual Israel, like many in the, the church Christendom claim to be today, spiritual Israel, that we had replaced Israel. But we learned really early on that God, we have not been anything to replace Israel. Um, matter of fact, at the first of this chapter that we're in, uh, Romans 11 verse 1, Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And the answer came in the same scripture, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So we, we learned here first and foremost that God has not cast away his people, that we are not spiritual Israel, that we do not stand in their stead, so to speak. We don't take their place. Um, there's so much more that we could go into in other parts of scripture to talk about that, um, but we won't at this particular time because it doesn't doesn't kind of go go along with what we um, what we're talking about tonight. The other thing that we learned in Romans chapter nine, though, that I want to point out tonight is that in Romans chapter nine verse eight, um, Romans chapter nine verse eight. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And back up in verse six, he says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So as we've moved forward through these chapters, we needed to keep that in mind. When Paul is talking about all Israel being saved, he's not talking about all of Israel in the fact of every person, all believing Israel will be saved, for they are not all Israel 
who are of Israel. And that's kind of what that means. Last week, we came up to, I said to you guys that he saved the best for last. And I truly felt that way. I feel that way even still, because we have gone through this entire three chapter segment digging in and peeling back layers and sometimes walking away, I think more confused than when we first sat down, but somehow the Holy Spirit always has a way of making those pieces come together when we just keep going. We just keep going back. I said uh, at one, one of our studies that I just read Romans 9, 10, and 11 over and over and over that week just because I needed to get that context. And it's amazing when we do that, what the Holy Spirit does. He puts those pieces together. He is ultimately our teacher. But last week, we started out in Romans 11, verse 25. And um, Paul said, I'm going to go there tonight, and I'm going to read it kind of up to where we are tonight. And then kind of give a little bit of a, a summary, and we will actually be covering 33 through 36 tonight. But Romans 11, verse 25, let's start there. He says, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So right there in that verse, we are admonished not to be ignorant. So when we, um, we can't claim that ignorance is bliss. You know, you've heard that term, ignorance is bliss. If I just don't know, I've said that many times as a nurse. I wish I didn't know what I know sometimes as a nurse, because then you see things that you wish you didn't have to see. It's just like the upcoming and imminent um death of my dear friend's dad. I knew that was coming because I knew what I was seeing. And sometimes ignorance in those things can be blissful, so to speak. But Paul says, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, puffed up in what your own thinking is. Uh, thinking that you have all the answers, so to speak, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. And he told us this because he told us prior in this same chapter, not to boast against the branches, the branches meaning Israel. So blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. We talked about that scripture kind of at length last week about there is a timeline right there. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And we talked about that bringing out the scripture last week about when that is, and that's going to be at the second coming of Christ. You and I will be raptured out of here when that time happens, when that, that comes for Israel. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for your father's sakes or for the father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So let's let's talk about as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. Um, a lot of people misinterpret that word election. And what does that mean to us here in this scripture? What is the context of it? They are beloved uh, as touching the election. They are beloved for the father's the fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are elect because of that right there, not because um, God is saying this group of people can be saved and this person can't be saved. He's not picking and choosing like um, predestined 
predestination type things. I don't want us to get that confused. A lot of people can get that confused right there because of the, the word in itself, election. But it is the election according to the grace of God. And because the gifts, uh, the promises uh, to make Israel a great nation was given to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And for that reason, that will happen. Why? Verse 29 tells us, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That's another scripture we talked about that we can use to stand on that platform of we are not spiritual Israel. And if you haven't grown up or been grafted into or ingrained, indoctrinated into that type of a theology, God bless you. It's not something you have to relearn. But for some of us, we had to relearn that and re-step through that to understand that we are not spiritual Israel. And that is one of the scriptures and one of the places right here in Romans that we can go to to understand that. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God is not going to take the promises that he gave to Israel and give them to us, uh, the Gentile, the body of Christ. Verse 30, for as ye in time past, times past, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. Verse 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now, when we finished there last week, we didn't read everything in our commentary about that. We didn't read everything on those scriptures in our commentary. We we put it all together and let the scripture speak for itself. But when he says, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all, he's including all, Jew, Gentile, the world, all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all all when they believe. So if you do have your commentary, we we study out of um, Eric Newman's Romans, You, God, and a KJV. Uh, if you do have that, we're going to turn to page 213. I'm going to share a few things about those passages of scripture that we just read to bring that to a close, and then we'll move on to the uh, verses 33 through 36. So God gave man paradise. Think about that. And man disobeyed God that he would be like uh, God so that he could be like God himself. That was what the serpent told Eve. Did God really say what you think he said? He knows if you do this, you're going to be like he is. God gave Israel the land, but Israel wanted to be the boss. Therefore, Israel created their own gods. And we have that example in the golden calf. These examples show that man's pride is so great that if God gives man something by grace, man exalts himself, believing that he earned what God gave him. Um, I'm going to share something a little bit later that hopefully will connect that. This means that in order to give man eternal life, God must first show man his failing so that man's pride does not get in the way of God's grace. I've heard it, I've heard this said uh, many times and I I think it's a good it's not in it's not a scripture it's just a saying that um God has to break a man before he can make a man. And that's that I think about pride in that. We have to have that pride broken so that we can understand who we are, you know, the first step, recognition of who we are. We are sinners before we are saved. We are sinners. We have to recognize that, that we are sinners, and we have to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the atonement of that. So uh, man's pride has to go, and in order for, for God to do that, we're going to read in a few minutes that his ways, the depth, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's, it's incredible that God could come up 
with a, a plan that he did. Um, giving man paradise, man disobeys God uh, so that he could or would be like God himself. Then God gave Israel land, but Israel wanted to be the boss. So Israel created their own gods. You see that process? Um, and, and those examples show that man's pride is so great that if God gives man something by grace, man exalts himself. We have that today in performance-based salvation. When we believe that it's anything on our part that we have done or can do to earn salvation, that's what that is. That's putting pride in the way of the grace of God. And we don't need to do that. Now, way back when at the Tower of Babel, God concluded the Gentiles way back there in unbelief, showing that the Gentiles are not worthy of eternal life. Then God called Abram and started the nation of Israel. Then at the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, God concluded Israel in unbelief. So you have God concluding the Gentiles in unbelief in Genesis uh, 11 or 12, whichever the Tower of Babel. And then you have God concluding Israel in unbelief in Acts chapter 7 at the stoning of Stephen. This means that all people have now been concluded in unbelief. Right there, we saw that in verse 32, Romans eleven thirty-two. 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And that talks about those the Gentile and the Jew. So since both Gentiles and Jews now uh, have rejected God's grace, God could now destroy the whole earth. And he did that in Noah's day. The problem with that is that the heaven and earth would still be unreconciled to God because no one believed God. Therefore, instead of standing up and judging the world in Acts chapter 7, which God could have done, and rightfully so, Jesus Christ stood up and he offered grace and peace. So in other words, the Gentiles obtained mercy from God due to the unbelief of Israel in, as that was concluded in Acts chapter 7. So the Gentiles, us, will now be saved through the dispensation of grace, which we are. Then when this dispensation is over, Israel will then see uh, that God gave the Gentiles eternal life by his mercy. They're not going to believe. We may have some that come to belief now in the dispensation of grace, and they will be saved if they do that as part of the body of Christ. Um, but God will give Israel mercy so that they also may be saved. Therefore, God must eliminate man's pride first before he can have mercy on all. So in other words, God cannot just give man eternal life because man will not handle it responsibly. God must first let man fall in unbelief before man will accept God's free gift of eternal life to him. How important and how precious is the grace of God to you? The grace of God to me is life. It is everything to me. But it wasn't much to me when I had that good girl syndrome. It wasn't much to me when I thought I was good enough in my own merit. I was lost in my pride in that. I had to be brought down from that pedestal that I had put myself on in my mind thinking I was a good girl. I didn't stay out after dark. I didn't, you know, disobey my parents. I didn't do all those things. I was a good girl. And so, but that was prideful thinking that you know, yeah, Jesus Christ died for my sins, but I didn't think I had them. I didn't think I, because I was a good girl. So that is pride. And we have to be broken from that uh, in order to understand the grace of God and how precious and priceless that gift is to us. So the Gentiles will be saved through the dispensation of grace, the Gentiles who will believe. The fullness of the Gentiles be come in when we read the scripture that talked about that. That's talking about when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in is when absolutely no more Gentiles will believe. 
And when that happens, God will stop the dispensation of the grace of God. We will be raptured up out of here or um, whichever way we go. Hopefully we're all raptured up. I hope we all live to see that day uh, rather than have to go by way of death, natural death. But um, I hope we're all raptured up out of here. But regardless, Gentiles will be saved through the dispensation of the grace uh, of the grace of God. Then when that dispensation is over, when we're raptured, Israel will see that God gave us, gave the Gentiles eternal life by his mercy. Therefore, God will then give Israel mercy so that they too may be saved. God must eliminate man's pride before he can have mercy on all. So God cannot just give man eternal life because we misuse and abuse. God gives us grace. But until I was willing to look at myself in the mirror and say, Karen, it doesn't matter how good you think you are in your own mind. The Bible tells me that there's none good. No, not one. And I had to come to terms with that. Of course, I was a teenager whenever all of that was going on in my mind. I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I don't do bad things. Um, so I've come a long way from my teenage years to in my 50s now, my late 50s at that. So this idea, though, that Eric is trying to put forth in our in our study here is not unlike an addict. And he shares that you can try to help an addict all you want to, but it will not do any good until the addict actually recognizes that he has a problem and that he cannot solve that problem on his own. We have to have help. Now, our help for our sin problem is Jesus Christ. Only then, when the addict recognizes he has a problem, will he accept help from you or anybody else. And similarly, that's just like us. We have a sin problem, and we must first recognize that we are sinners, and we have no capacity within ourselves to overcome that problem. Only then, Will we even come close to believing the gospel, accepting God's free gift of eternal life to us? You know, that that um, that reminds me of Isaiah 64, 6, that talks about that filthy rags type of righteousness. When I think that I can can achieve or, or earn something on my own, it is that filthy rags type of righteousness. So here there's there's people and you might not have heard them, but there are people who think that God plays favorites. So we saw God playing favorites with Israel, giving them favored nation status in spite of who they were. And now we see God playing favorites with the Gentiles. Well, he's just dispensing his grace and, you know, and, and Israel is in blindness. So people have a tendency to, to, from a viewpoint that is not rightly dividing the word of truth, to, to label God as playing some favorites here. So Eric tells us here that we see now see the purpose of God in playing favorites, if you want to think of it like that. The whole world was in unbelief in Genesis 11, but God only concluded the Gentiles in unbelief at that time while offering mercy to Abram in Genesis 12. That's when Abram got his calling was in Genesis 12. Initially, this seems unfair to the Gentiles. However, God's mercy to the Jew is what made the Gentiles jealous. You remember, that's a that's a word we should know. Um, made the Gentiles jealous of the Jews' position with God. Therefore, when God removed the Jews from their favored position in Acts chapter 7, the Gentiles began believing Paul's gospel. Now, God has blinded the Jews in today's dispensation, and that may seem unfair to the Jew. However, God's mercy to the Gentiles will make the Jews jealous of their position with God. You see how that works? It's a two, two-fold thing. Um that's why we aren't to boast against the branches. That's a that's a very deep thing right there as far as those branches. We talked a lot about the branches and the olive tree and what that represented. Um, God's mercy to the Gentiles will make the Jews jealous. 
of their position with God. Therefore, when God does rapture up the body of Christ and makes Israel his people again, they will begin believing the gospel of the kingdom. Therefore, God plays favorites or seemingly plays favorites, not because he likes one group of people over the other, but because he must do things this way in order for man to overcome pride. Remember, we have to have pride broken so that we can believe the gospel in order to have eternal life with God. So therefore, the judgment that God showed the Gentiles when he called Israel to be his people was really the only way God could provoke the Gentiles to believe God. Similarly, the judgment God shows Israel in this current dispensation is really the only way God can provoke the Jews. Remember the scripture, provoke the Jews to jealousy. There's that word. So that they too would believe God. So therefore, God doesn't hate anyone. As John 3, 16 tells us, God so loved the world. Rather, he judges groups of people at different times so that all might accept his love for them. We are a privileged people to have the word of God in its completeness, in its perfect form from Genesis to Revelation. Now, you and I, I I'm just astounded when I think about where I used to be when I wasn't rightly dividing the word and how I just kind of muddied it. Lori likes to call that mixed up doctrine, mud, mixed up doctrine. We muddy the doctrine. We muddy the word of God. And so we don't, we're not able to fully grasp it. Um, I'm amazed at that, truly amazed. But when we don't do that, we can see that picture of the Gentile, the Jew, and, and why the Gentile was, was considered an unbelief. Then the Jew was considered an unbelief. And, and now that we have the dispensation of grace, all of that is just an amazing unfolding of God's word. It's an unfolding not only of his word, but of his love, of God's love to us. So the judgment that God showed the Gentiles when he called Israel to be his people was really the only way that God could provoke the Gentiles to believe God. And similarly, the judgment God shows to Israel in this current dispensation is the only way God can provoke them, the Jew, to jealousy, to believe him. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know that I, I I'm going to just share it as it's written, but if you're a mother and you have more than one child, and say you're raising those kids kind of together. Um, I, my kids were two years apart, so they were very close in age. Um, I don't. I tried never to show favoritism between my children, but but you wanted your kids. I wanted to please my parents as a child. I wanted to make my parents happy. This is pinned here by Eric, and he says it this way, and I'm going to share it. It's sort of like having two kids and punishing one by not giving him attention so that he will come to you, say he's sorry and receive your love again. Well, we never withdraw our love. Even in, in discipline, we never withdraw our love, but we have to show that child those behaviors that are disappointing to us. Because that child, I can remember wanting to please my parent. So God, in that sense, um, in the Gentile, the Jew, now the dispensation of grace, needs the, the Jew to be blinded in this moment, basically, to feel that temporary um separation. I don't know that that's a good word. I'm searching for my words here tonight. Forgive me. Temporary situation or, or separation in order to see how important God's love is. So when God comes and takes the, the body of Christ, the Jew is then going to realize 
the value of that and then believe God, if that makes any sense. That's what basically Paul has been talking about in Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11. And it brings us to the end of Romans 11, which we're going to share 33 through 36, Romans 11, 33 through 36. The first scripture, 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Exclamation point. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. When we talk about that and we unfold it the way that happens, it's hard for us to understand, but that God did it in such a way that will bring people to salvation. God did it in such a way that will break pride off of man so that we understand how important his love is, how important the grace of God is on our life the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Verse 34 says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So just understanding the previous scriptures, verses 30 through 32, is no small task. And I don't pretend that it is. This whole 9 through 11, I've said it every week, I think. I can't wait to be finished with 9 through 11. And I've had other people say, you know, I'm really glad we're getting to the end of this because we need to move. It, it, we, it's just hard it's good stuff and we need to know it, but it's very difficult to grasp. So just understanding what Paul said in those verses 30 through 32 is no small task as very few Christians ever allow the Holy Ghost to teach them that because we water ski through God's word and we hit the high points because they make us feel good and they make us uh, really kind of boastful in a way. They puff us up in some pride until we dig deep. And a lot of Christians, especially in the church world today, they don't want to do that. They just want to skim the surface. So very few of them will ever learn even what your takeaways are in these last months in these three chapters, uh, because they don't allow the Holy Ghost to teach them that as seen in the uh, prevalent idea in Christianity is that we're spiritual Israel today. Well, we know that that is just not not the truth. Since we need the Holy Ghost to teach us what God is doing, and even then it is difficult to understand, it would be impossible for any of us to figure out God's plan with our own human wisdom, much less actually come up with his plan ourselves. That's why Paul is bringing this, these three very difficult chapters to a conclusion by saying, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Do you think God, Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would have pinned that there if this had been an easy section of scripture we were studying? No, he would not have. We, he, he understood that what he was just teaching was going to be difficult for us to grasp. So he brings it to this close by saying, oh, the depth of the riches um, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's it's amazing to me how that happens. Lucifer, if you'll remember, scripture tells us that he was created full of wisdom and he still had no idea that God's plan all along was going to be to redeem man by having Jesus Christ die on a cross. So in our human, if, if Lucifer, who was full of wisdom, couldn't figure out that God was going to, to put Jesus on a cross. How are we, we cannot figure all of this out either. Therefore, we must say with Paul, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
The psalmist tells us that God had beset him behind and before and laid his hand on him. That's Psalm 139, 3. So in other words, God protected him from going to hell. How did God do this? The psalmist said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. But now we can know the answer because it has been revealed to us by the Holy Ghost. Because God's plan is so deep in wisdom and knowledge on our own, his judgments and are unsearchable and his ways are past finding out. And that reminds me of a scripture that I've said many, many times starting out. You know, Romans is the foundational book of doctrine for the dispensation of grace. If you rightly divide the word of truth, you have to start in Romans. You have to, because it lays the foundation in which everything else is going to be built and, and that foundational doctrine. So, but what this reminds me of, so I always, a lot of times would start out our scriptures or start out our Bible studies by reminding us of Isaiah 55, eight and nine, where God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That to me equates with verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's how, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I pray, Lord, open us up to the, to the, Holy Spirit teaching and leading and guiding us through your word that we can understand the gravity of who you are because who you are is life to us. We can't have life in ourselves. We can't have life on our own that our God knew from the beginning that we would need this dispensation of grace where he would dispense undeserved mercy to us so that in his ultimate plan, that through that, through Israel's fall, we would receive salvation and through our salvation, Israel would believe and also receive salvation. I pray, Father, open us up to understand that. Let us know the value of your riches let us know the value of your grace. But Lucifer, created full of wisdom, still had no idea what God's plan was going to be. So we have to conclude with Paul, as he did in verse 33. A good way to understand this is by looking at the Bible. We have God's perfect word today, and so few people even understand a small percentage of it. Why? First, the natural man cannot understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. We learn that in 1 Corinthians 2. Therefore, you must believe God's gospel before you can even begin to understand what you're reading because it takes the Holy Ghost teaching the Bible to you as you read it. I, I, I read something today that I wanted to share and it, it comes out of this, I don't know if you can see that, Two Minutes with the Bible, uh, devotional, and it's called today, the, the reading for today is called The Time Element in Scripture. And th this brings me to the thought of how we can't really understand the, the Word of God when we don't rightly divide it, even though we might have had at some point in our lives that false sense of understanding, but we were picking, like I said, water skiing over the surface of it, but this is called the time element in scripture. How many scriptural problems would be solved? How many seeming contradictions explained if we were more careful to note the time element emphasized so strongly in the word of God? In Romans 5 verse 12, we learn that sin entered the human race by Adam. Then later the law entered but still later, the Apostle Paul arose to say, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's Romans 3.21. Early in man's history, 
blood sacrifices were required for acceptance with God. Later, circumcision and the law, and still later, repentance and water baptism. But not until Paul do we learn of salvation by grace through faith alone, on the basis of Christ's finished, all-sufficient work of redemption. This is why the apostle refers to uh, refers in Galatians 3.23 to the faith which should afterward be revealed. This is why he declares that our Lord gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time and adds, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. It is only as we recognize the time element in scripture that we see the difference between the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven and the body of Christ, between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God, between the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of the grace of God. A comparison of Romans 3, 21 and 26 shows how this time element is emphasized in scripture. After discussing the function of the law in verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul declares in Romans 3, 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Then when you, you uh, compare that to verse 26, he states that uh, it is God's purpose to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The time element is important to God. It's important as we read the scriptures, as we read and believe the scriptures. So when we do that in the proper context, we, like Paul, can just stand in amazement, stand in awe of God at the depth of the riches, both of the knowledge or the wisdom and knowledge of God. So God is the beginning and the ending. We're told that in scripture, Revelation 1, 8. The Lord possessed wisdom from everlasting, from the beginning. No one else uh, was there when God made his plan. So verse 34 says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? So no one else was there when God made his plan. Therefore, he had no counselor and no one knew his mind since all things were made by him and without him, not anything was made that was made. Everyone and everything is lower than God. I cannot even figure out what another person thinks. <laughs> I read something that said, and, and it's in a little book I'm going to share when I give my testimony, but it says, you know, when it's contrasting the 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 dispensations, um, we can't we can't by faith move a mountain today. We can't by faith um, do any anything. And it said, by faith you can't turn this page. You have to use your hand to turn the page, and that's the truth. So we we have to realize that no one. Can, can truly know uh, the mind of the Lord, but the Lord himself. We know his mind through his word. That much we do know. I don't want to get confused on that. But um, we no one was around basically when God created the earth. There was no counselor present for him. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. So without him was not anything made that was made. Everyone and everything is lower than God. I, again, cannot even figure out what another person thinks. I cannot figure out the of my creator in that sense. So when Satan said in Isaiah 14, 14, I will be like the most high, he had no idea what that meant and no way of achieving that goal. He thought he did, but he didn't. Even though he was, the Bible says, full of wisdom, he could never be like 
God. He could never know God in that way. He couldn't figure out that Jesus was going to die on a cross. Certainly then, since we are fallen men and women, we cannot achieve to God's level. It is only by his grace that we are where we are and that we are positioned where we are positioned. God makes the wisdom of this world out to be foolish. Therefore, I cannot give anything to God. He can only give to me. And I have a reference here written down for 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 1. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, basically 18 through 25. It says this, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, we aren't wise in and of ourselves. The wisdom is of God. And the only God has to give to us. We don't give to God in that sense. He can only give to me. So when we close this up here in, in Romans 11, verse 36 says, for of him and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So all things are of him, all things are through him, and all things are to him. So for us to have eternal life, we have to receive the righteousness that's not of ourselves. I can't stand in my own righteousness. I have to receive the righteousness that is of God. And that righteousness comes through the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are then to give to him to be part of his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Um, since all things are of, through, and to him, God receives the eternal glory. So that is not to say that sin, evil, murder, all these things, etc., are of God. Have you, has anybody ever asked you that question? If God is so good, why do we have evil? Well, we have evil because we live in a fallen world. God, sin, evil, murder, etc. those things are not of God. All of those things uh, will pass away when all of this is said and done, so to speak. Uh, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. The word says, behold, I make all things new. So when God made the world, he saw that it was very good. That's in Genesis 1.31. Since then, he has allowed Satan, man, and sinful things to prevail on this earth for over 6,000 years so that we would have faith in God. Once all have faith who will have faith, God gets rid of the former things of sin and makes all things new. And those new things are now beautiful, Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us, which shows that faith has been added to God's very good creation to make it beautiful. Therefore, it took us suffering through the temporal things in order for us to have faith in the eternal things. We can't know that without the Holy Spirit within us teaching it to us. These last three chapters of Romans 9, 10, and 11, I'm grateful to be bringing them to a close tonight because, and they're closing on a good 
a good note to be able to say as verse 33, and I've said it over and over tonight, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. If I could summarize all three chapters together, it would have to be with that scripture. And I would have to say to you, read it over and over and over that the Holy Spirit can discern these things to you to understand why these scriptures are placed here in the midst of a foundational book of doctrine for the dispensation of grace. They're there for a reason. They're not there to confuse us. They're not there to be a stumbling block to us in our walk. They're not there so that we have to say, hmm, I don't guess I'm ever going to understand that. So let me just move on. We can understand them to the extent that we can. But Paul brings it to that statement. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And then down in verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. I, I'm going to be honest with you today. Today's been a tough day for me. Um, and I've been contemplating this lesson. I've been contemplating my excitement over it because I was just so excited to have it. And as I reread and reread and reread today, even, um, I'm thinking, Lord, only you are going to be able to make any of this come to that fruition of closing that you need it to come to or that we need it to come to in our mind. So I can only say to him, be glory forever. Amen. And as we continue to, to, to learn God's word, rightly divided, um, we will learn more and more as we go along. That's all I can say. That's all I know. I'm going to close this right here, but I am going to say this. Next week, I'm going to give my testimony. Um, and I don't know that it'll be an hour long, so I might ask. Um, I was going to ask Lisa. I don't want to put her on the spot. I can talk to her separately. <laughs> but Lisa, if she wanted to give her, her testimony as well, she gave a testimony when we did it before, and it's something that, that you ladies probably haven't heard. And so... Um, it, it will be very profitable for everybody to hear it. So I'll talk to her privately and see if she wants to do that next week. If she doesn't, that's fine. We can do, do it another time. But I'm going to share with you as we close tonight a couple of things that I'm going to talk about in my testimony that changed my life. Not to mention just the word of God itself. But there were two books that um, the first one that was given to me is called Jesus Wasn't Talking to You. I don't know if you can read that. Jesus Wasn't Talking to You. Very tiny little book. And it was, the other one is called The Bible, The Big Picture. This one is by John and Lori Verstegen. Y'all pr probably all know those names. This one is by someone who's long since gone, but it's Terrence McLean. But I'm going to talk about those next week um, and share how they impacted my testimony and my life when it comes to the dispensation of the grace of God and understanding what it means to rightly divide the word. What it means is that we stand here in the place of Romans 11 and we are standing in the midst of the wisdom and the knowledge of God by his grace and by his grace alone. And I'm so grateful for that. So I hope that um, after our testimonies, we will move on to Romans 12. In Romans 12, you're going to see a different, uh, a different threshold to cross. And it will be an easier one to cross, honestly. Um, a different place in scripture and a, a just a very rich, rich section 
that we will cross. So let's close tonight with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this night. Lord, you know that you know my heart and you know my head. And sometimes my head is my biggest enemy. The thoughts that go through my mind, Father. That in my inadequacy, I bring forth confusion or lack of understanding when that's not at all the case in my heart. So, Father, I pray that as we make this the closing segment on Romans chapter 11, bringing these three chapters to a close, Father, that as these ladies read that, read those three chapters on their own, as we said last week, you don't need a commentary, you don't need anything but the Word of God and the Holy Spirit within you to understand what the Scriptures are saying. So, Father, as we move forward in the coming weeks, I thank you that you saw fit to put Romans 9, 10, and 11 for purposes that may be beyond our understanding in this moment. But you saw fit to put them in there for a reason. And, Father, that we could understand, ultimately, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So we thank you for that, Father. I, I see that Julie popped on and popped off, so I continue to lift her up to you, Lord, that you would comfort her and her family during this time of grief. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.